I am thankful that in spite of circumstance, it is well with our souls. Do you believe that? There was a period in my life um, where my worship felt dead, where I literally felt like just a shell of a person on stages like this. We do this 80, 100 times a year, and I literally felt like, yo, there's something wrong with me because I'm up here singing these songs, and I almost feel like an actor. Not that I don't believe what I'm singing, but I'm having to act like I'm feeling all this. And I sat down with my father, who's a pastor. His name's Tony Evans out of Dallas. I told him, I said, Dad, I need... I said... (laughs) Security. I'm just kidding. (laughs) I'm just playing. (laughs) I said, Dad, I'm having some major issues right now. Like, something's wrong with me. I feel dead on the inside, and I'm I'm not necessarily getting with this whole thing anymore and I don't want to be disingenuous I don't want disingenuine is that a word I just impressed myself I was like disingenuous uh, <laughs> I said I don't want to be disingenuous I don't want to get up on stage I don't want to be singing these songs if I don't believe it and he I said my I feel dead on the inside I talked to my dad for like 30 minutes and all this emotion I'm an emotional dude I look like a football player but some days I have the emotions of a ballerina whatever I'm an artist it's part of the deal you know like artists we're just weird like that so my dad after 30 minutes of me ranting he said to me let's talk about football for a second and I was like what what I'm trying to share my heart with you you want to talk about football this doesn't make any sense And he said no I want to talk about football so I was listening to him with this face of like you got to be kidding me right now he said, Anthony, what would happen if I took you to a football game? My brother's a chaplain for the Cowboys, so we'll breeze by that because I know that's like, ba- exactly. It's bad. It's bad here. But he said, what if we went to a game and all you saw this whole time, all you saw the whole time you were at the game, the whole three hours, all you watched was a huddle. All you saw was all the guys in a huddle. How would you feel for three hours of a huddle? I told him I would feel gypped. I would feel like this is the whole point of the game is so that I can see them play on the field. It doesn't make any sense for me to me for them to be in a huddle for three hours. I'd be irritated. He said, what else? I would probably leave. What else? I wouldn't be excited at all about being there. He said, okay, now let's go back to what you were talking about before, about you feeling dead on the inside. He said, let me tell you why you feel dead on the inside. Because you are spending your whole life inside of four walls of a church in nice Christian huddles and you're discussing the plays, you're discussing the coach, and you're discussing all the things that you know in your head, but you are never breaking huddle and doing anything on the field of your life, and that is why you feel dead on the inside. In that moment, I was challenged, obviously, because I've spent years, 15 years now, I started when I was eight. I'm trying to figure out what's so funny. <laughs> Spent 15 years now on the road, and what I had done for years is walk into a room like this, discuss the plays, discuss the coach, but I wasn't breaking huddle and making a difference on the field of my life. Nothing was changing outside of these rooms, and, th- and that's why I felt um, dead on the inside. I had a, one of my best friends, his name is Ben, he told me about... Um, an organization he's worked with, he's worked with for years called Feed the Children, and he started talking to me, and I told him about what my dad said to me, and I started talking to him uh, um, about what he does, and as soon as he brought up Feed the Children, I told him my dad wanted me to do something outside of the walls of church. Um, I looked at him, and I just started shaking my head, like, don't even do it, because I'm not sponsoring any kid. I'm not doing any of that, because in my head, all these years growing up, going to Christian concerts and events and church and all that stuff, I always thought... You're asking me to sponsor a kid, but what's really going to happen is I'm going to sponsor some kid and end up sponsoring the president of your organization who drives a Ferrari and lives in Malibu. Like, that's how my mind thought. That's that's how I thought. So I was like, no, I'm good. So Ben smiled at me, and being one of my best friends, we obviously ended up talking about it. He said, come with me to Oklahoma City and visit visit Feed the Children. Visit what and see what we're doing. So I flew with him to Oklahoma City, hung out with him for the day at work, and I was like, oh, this is legit. Like, this is for real. And um, I was being very quick to say no, but I'd learned things about financial accountability and things that were happening. I learned that 93 cents of every dollar that is given goes to these kids. So I said, Ben, I will sponsor one kid, but here's the deal. I want you to take me to visit him. And I thought I had him stumped. I made that a condition. I did give him ultimatums because he's my friend. I mean, that's what friends do. Not really. (laughs) 
I told him, I will sponsor a child if you take me to visit him. And I thought Ben was going to say, well, we can't necessarily do that because, you know, that one child represents a lot of children who need help, so you can't necessarily do that. But two weeks later, I was on a plane going to Malawi, Africa to um, visit this, this picture that was on my refrigerator. At that point, I, I sponsored the kid. His name is Forget. I put a picture of him in my refrigerator, and I was praying for him and doing, stu- doing something with my something outside of these walls. I was doing something, and I kind of I was getting excited about it. I got some correspondence from him almost immediately. Um, a few days later, he was notified. So we, long story short, went to visit this kid. I, I flew 24 hours to Malawi, Africa, got out of the plane, looked like National Geographic. I was like, yo, this is crazy. Like, <laughs> And then we got in a Jeep or something and drove four more hours out to the middle of nowhere. And up until this point, it was just a pic- he was just a picture on my refrigerator. And I got out of the truck and out from behind a tree peeked this little face. And it was a little face from my fridge. And he knew who I was, obviously, that fast. And he walked up to me with his hands up in the air, looking at me like, you're the biggest human being I've ever seen in my life. (laughs) I picked up this little boy, and I just hung with him. I know I probably scared him because I was so excited. Like, my heart was started to beat again, for lack of a better way to say it. And all I could think was, this is what I was created for. I was not created to have all this wealth of knowledge and what I'm supposed to be doing and all this kindness and grace and mercy extended to me and not be extending it to somebody else. That is, this is what I was created for. So I gave him, you know, I'd gone through the airport and got him a soccer ball and M&Ms and some, you know, cars or whatever. And I gave those to him. And the interpreter told me things throughout the day, just keeping me informed. She said, Anthony, what you were given this kid, what you were giving forget, um, is worth more than what his family will bring in in the, in the next year. Like, that's what these gifts are worth. And I know that you don't think that way, but I just want to inform you on this is how this is how it goes. Now, at that point in my life, things were hard here, and things not that our economy's gotten great or anything, but that was right when gas first went up to like $6 million a gallon. And I was like, yo, I told Ben, I was like, can I get sponsored? Can you take a picture of me and put it on the table? Like, for real, I'm not playing. Like, <laughs> I'm not kidding. I was like, I need... Some help. So it was a step of faith for me to go outside of my box and to do this for this little kid. But as I sat with him through that day, I thought, Ben challenged me. He was like, Anthony, I know that things are weird and hard, but I want you to go look through your receipts to see what, was, what is repetitive for you. And for me, it was, it was a little place called Starbucks that I noticed was coming up a lot on my credit card receipts. I noticed that in a month, I spent enough money on coffee to sponsor two kids. During my hard times, I was going to get coffee before I went to write songs or went on a trip or whatever. And my sacrifice, as I stared this little kid in the face, I thought it took me years to do this because I would hear people talk about this and I would shut off and be like, "Eh, somebody else would do that. I would hear people talk about this and it took me years to make a sacrifice to change your whole existence. And my sacrifice was coffee. This little boy was receiving food education, food and clean water. He could go to school now because he didn't have to walk three miles to go get water. Food, education, essentials, because he's not buying toothbrushes and toothpaste because he couldn't afford food. And disaster relief. All that was happening with my $32, and I could not believe it. I was really inspired when I was there with this family. I was inspired because the Lord has commanded us to take care of the widow and the orphan, and I feel like when we obey his commands, there is a breakthrough for us in general. I asked the family, I said, is there anything else I can do for you outside of this $32? Like, I'm, I'm inspired, I'm here, I came all this way. Like, I didn't want to be the American that showed up to save the day, but at the same time, I wanted to, to do more. And they said to me, we would love our dream home. And I thought, I shouldn't have asked that question. <laughs> so I, I smiled at them and was like, oh, okay, <laughs> okay, <laughs> great. I said, well, what does that mean? You know, can you explain to me, this interpreter lady, what that means? What, what's their dream? Because to me, at that point, you know, dream home was extreme home makeover. And Ty Pennington yelling, here's your new media room. Ah! You know, that was my, in my head, that's what dream home was. So they walked me to their home, which um, if we put the average of all the major, all the master closet, master bedroom closets in this room, if we averaged them together, that was the size of their house. Um, and they we walked in and I looked around and they said, our dream, if you look up, and I looked up and saw the sky. They said, our dream is to have a roof so we don't get wet when it rains. That was their dream. Now, I know some of us in this room have had it hard, but they're in, a, in our country in general, there's a very small percentage of people who've had it that hard. 
So I obviously did that for them. And Feed the Children isn't asking for that. What I've been inspired to do as I'm out on the road doing this real life, real worship tour is to make sure that there's something being offered for us to do outside of the four walls of this room. Now before I, um, actually I'll tell you this, growing up my, my responsibility in my home um, was to empty the trash and it drove me nuts. Every Tuesday and Thursday my dad would come in and pull the covers off me, which is a whole nother subject, like <laughs> traumatic, wake, you know, like that's a traumatic way to wake up your kids. And I know some of you do it because you're smiling at me like, <laughs> don't do that. He would say, Anthony, it's time to take out the trash. And I was in like a hyper spiritual thing when I was 12 or 13. I, I don't remember the ex exact age. And I told my dad, I said, you know what, dad, I've been praying about that. And I just don't feel like that's where <laughs> the Lord wants me. I, like right now, I need to really rest. I need to get my heart right for, anyway, my dad looked at me and said, I can change the way that you feel. That's one. And two, you're my child. You bear my name and you live in my house. So this is my father talking to me. So this is, not, this is not a suggestion, it's a command. That's, that's what's gonna happen because you bear my name, you're my kid, and you live in my house. When I held this little boy, I remember thinking to myself of that story and how many times my response to God when he's asking me to take care of the widow, the orphan, and the less fortunate has been, let me pray about it. I'm not feeling it right now, I need a second. As his kids, and I've, I've noticed y'all do so much for your community, as his kids, He's not suggesting to us that we do what he says. He's commanding us to do what he says. And I was offered that opportunity, and it changed my life. Um, Feed the Children said to me, Anthony, um, we want you to take another trip before you go out on the road. And I was like, I can't. I don't have time. I'm uh, very thankful for things that are going on in my life right now. I was um, on a show called The Voice a couple years ago, and I got hired by the show to be a talent producer, so I'm doing that and leading worship and running all over. And I was like, I don't have time to, to, to go anywhere like that right now. They said, listen to us. We're not asking you to go to Africa. We're asking you to go to California. And I was like, what are you talking about? And they said something to me in that moment. I was already sold before that. They said something to me that changed my whole perspective on them as an organization. They are one of the first organizations in the world that allows us to sponsor kids here in the United States that have the same needs as kids in Africa and Guatemala and Haiti and in all these countries that we've, we've been in supporting. I didn't know, I could rattle off a bunch of stats to you, but I won't do that, but I didn't know that one in five kids in the United States goes to bed food insecure. I didn't know that. I've had teachers come up to me after um, these um, after whether it's a concert or a Sunday morning and tell me they have students who come to school to eat like they haven't eaten and they have the government lunches and that's they're hungry in class. I had a coach tell me that during summer two a days he stopped practice and was like what is wrong with everybody and it just dawned on him to ask who has not eaten and half the team hadn't eaten because they it was summer it was summer and it was two days and they hadn't eaten I didn't realize that that was happening here in the United States so we have the opportunity to act in obedience today, and this is and there are different ways to act in obedience, but this is one of the, a way that it's made pretty pretty easy for us, and there are tons of different ways that your, um, your, your church has offered. This morning, Feed the Children gives us the opportunity to sponsor one of these little kids here that, that needs our help. What I noticed in my life is that my obedience brought about breakthrough for me and in turn, it brought through breakthrough, breakthrough for other people. When I sat down with my dad and told him all this, he reminded me of my, our objective should be to worship outside of these walls. This is a huddle. A huddle's a few seconds. The game is out on the field. But then he reminded me that in every scenario in the Bible where, where somebody was asked to do something that was going to be major, a major breakthrough for them and for others, there was something that seemed insignificant that they had to do in order to receive that breakthrough. You can look at the story of Moses. He was asked to pick up a rod and, and, part of, and, and then the Red Sea would be parted. Now, if I were him and saw all those plagues and a pillar of fire in the sky by night and, and a cloud by day, I would have been like, can you just part it? I, I don't want to pick up a stick. Can you just, um, we got some trouble. Can you just, that would be my response, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Noah building an ark when there's never been rain. That doesn't make sense. The 10 lepers, the story of the 10 lepers gets me every time because God said, Jesus said to them, I read the story all these years growing up, that Jesus healed them and then sent them to the priest to show themselves to the priest. 
me and my dad sat down. And he said, read it closer. I was like, okay, I don't get it. And then he said, Jesus told them that they would be healed. Okay, got it. And the next line says, and as they went, they were cleansed. Didn't say he healed them and then sent them. He said, you will be healed. And as they did what he said, they were healed. God is commanding us to take care of the widow and the orphan. God's commanding us to break this big huddle in this room and let people know that there's been a difference. In just a second, we're going to sing the chorus of a song together. Um, a song that's a reminder of how jealous he is for our hearts. The ushers have these picture folders. So Tobin, if you could hand me one of those, that'd be great because I don't have it. I should. Um, I forgot. They're going to hand out these little picture folders while we're singing this chorus. He loves us. And it was mentioned earlier that a lot of, a lot of times the way that people know about our Savior is by their needs being met first. Thank you very much. What was, what was that? <laughs> um, but by their needs being met first. It takes three minutes to change a child in a family's life forever. Three minutes. We're going to pass these out. There's an envelope on the inside that you fill out and give back to us. We need to have this before you go so we know who's sponsored. And you take this home. Now, in the last service, they sponsored a bunch of kids. And if we run out of these packets, we have a, a, a makeshift one that will give you this envelope. You fill it out, and you're going to get in, in less than a week. You're going to get notified. And because of child protection laws and the kids are actually here, their pictures aren't on the covers because we can't necessarily do that. But you will be notified in seven days of, of the family whose life's being changed. Mike, if you could noodle around back there. It makes me feel more spiritual when you're playing. Thanks. going to sing this chorus. And again, if you're interested in using this way as your way to make an impact outside of these, these four walls, then right where you are, the ushers are coming down. We want you to raise your hand. We're going to pass this out to you as we sing this chorus. Today, I know that we can change a hundred kids' lives. And I know that they're doing what they say because I've done everything but dig through the president of the company's drawers to make sure that they're doing what they say.